We are continuing our study in the book of Galatians. We're in Galatians chapter number 1, and we're going to pick up there with verse number 11 this evening. The Apostle Paul begins his defense of the word of God and the gospel of Christ to the false teachers, the Judaizers, and to the church at Galatia. who were, were abandoning their newfound faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to go back to adding the law to that grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it just can't be done. Can't mix the law with the grace of God. It just cannot be done. Like oil and vinegar or oil and water, they just don't mix. And Paul was working to persuade these Galatians to be able to continue to stand in the faith and in the liberty that they had in knowing Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. And there in verse number 11, so read down through verse number 14 tonight, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for neither received, neither for I, excuse me, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have all heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Again, dear Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for your word and pray now, Lord, you will bless this time in your word to speak to our hearts to help us grow closer to you and our faith. For Father, we ask it, we pray these things now in Jesus' name, amen. The philosopher Emerson, he once wrote, whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. And many thinking people agree with that. The English art critic John Roskin, he once said, I fear uniformity. You cannot manufacture great men any more than you can manufacture gold. I think that's a true statement too. The German philosopher Schopenhauer, probably crucified that, but that's okay. He wrote, we forfeit, we forfeit three-fourths of ourselves in order to live like other people. People. Francis Alby, the first bishop of the United Methodist Church in the United States, once prayed at a deacon's ordination, O Lord, grant that these brethren may never want to be like other people. Of course, being a nonconformist as a believer in Christ can be a good thing. But there is nonconformity that can be rather bad and have severe consequences. There is a wrong kind of individualism that destroys instead of fulfills. But in a society like ours that is accustomed to interchanging parts, it's good to meet someone like Paul who dared to be himself in the will of God. I am that I am, Paul said. But his freedom in Christ was a threat to those who found safety in conformity. And people who stand out challenge those who live a conformist life. Our former president, Donald Trump, is an example of that. He's a nonconformist. No matter what you think about him, his politics, his policies, or anything like that, the man's just different. He doesn't play by the same rules. He doesn't go by the same norms. He's a completely different animal. And that's why the political conformists are afraid of him. Because he does stand out. Because he is different. 
And one of the reasons why many people are afraid of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ is because when they're living for the Lord, they stand out. They're different from the world. They're different from the norm. So people are afraid of a believer who will truly stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who are afraid to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, they will conform to the world around them. Thus we have carnality. Worldly Christians in the church. Because they don't want to stand out. They do want to be the same. Paul's enemies pointed out to Paul's, pointed to Paul's nonconformity as proof that his message and his ministry were not really of God. Their argument was that he claims to be an apostle, but he does not stand in the apostolic tradition. And it's this misrepresentation that Paul answers here in this section of verses that we'll be looking at over the next couple of weeks to the end of the chapter. Paul's nonconformity was divinely deliberate. God had chosen to reveal himself to Paul in a different way than he did the other 12 apostles. We read there in verses 11 and 12 that Paul states his theme in this, in, in this section. That Paul's message and ministry are of divine origin. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. The gospel and ministry that Paul had preached, it came from God. He didn't invent the gospel. Nor did he receive the gospel from the other apostles or from men. He received the gospel directly from Jesus Christ, as he will show proof of in later verses here in chapter 1. Both Paul's message and his apostolic ministry, they were divinely given to him by God. And therefore, anybody who added anything to Paul's gospel was in danger of divine judgment. Anyone who took away from Paul's gospel was subject to divine judgment. Just like anyone who takes or adds to this word of God that God has given us is in danger of divine judgment. There is many a pastor, many a preacher, many a teacher that will have to stand before God that to one day and give an account of why they didn't preach what God had given them. I pray I'm not one of them. Because I'd hate to stand there. Talk about a hot seat. That seat would be burning. The gospel was given to the Apostle Paul by the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven. We find in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Paul tells this to the Corinthian church. There in verse number 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which ye also are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. 
For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, and then all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. The Apostle Paul preached what he had received, received of God. And the best way for Paul to be able to prove this point and to be able to prove this argument was to reach back into his past. To remind the believers there in Galatia of the way that God had dealt with him. Paul states that his past life was already known by his readers. We read there in verse number 13, the first part of verse 13 in our text. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. So they had heard of this Jew who was known then as Saul of Tarsus. His reputation and his acts. So this is a pretty good argument to be able to use. But it was obvious that they didn't fully understand what those experiences meant. So Paul, so Paul flashes on the screen, if you will, three pictures of his past as evidence that his apostleship and his gospel are truly of God. And the first picture we'll start to look at this evening is that of Paul the persecutor that we read in verses 13 and 14. Paul stated here, with his past conduct as an unconverted Jewish rabbi that he was as Saul of Tarsus. He recounts this when he gives his personal testimony to Felix or Festus, one of those two, and to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 22 and in Acts chapter 26. And we also see that in his conversion story in Acts chapter 9. And we'll get to some of those verses here in a little while. It gives there a vivid account of these years from the Apostle Paul's mouth himself. In this historic flashback, Paul points out his relationship to the church there in verse number 13, how he persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And he also... And he also speaks about his relationship to the Jewish religion in verse number 14. And profited in the Jews of religion above many mine equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Paul was persecuting the church and profiting and progressing in the Jewish religion. Everything was going his way, if you will. And Paul was being recognized as a spiritual leader in the nation of Israel. And among the Jewish rabbis. It's interesting to note here the words that are used to describe the Apostle Paul's activities. When Paul was known as Saul of Tarsus persecuting the church. In Acts chapter 8 and verse number 1, he consented to the murder of Stephen, it says there. As Stephen was stoned in Acts chapter 7, 
for his testimony of the gospel. And Paul consented to that murder. And then in verse number 3 in Acts chapter 8, the Bible says that he proceeded to make havoc of the church. He caused chaos in the church and in the Christian faith by his going to arrest Christians, to have them thrown in jail, to have them persecuted for their faith. By breaking up families and putting believers in prison, the very atmosphere that he breathed threatenings and slaughter in Acts chapter 9 and verse 1 as he was headed to Damascus. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts in Acts 22 and verses 4 and 5 that the apostle Paul was bent on destroying the church and that he even voted to kill believers. Acts chapter 22 and verses 4 and 5. And I persecuted this way, meaning the way of Christianity, unto the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women. As also the high priest doth bear me witness and all the estimate of the and all the estate of the elders from whom also I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. In Acts chapter 26 and verse number 9, as he gives his testimony there to King Agrippa, Acts chapter 26 and verses 9 through 11. I verily, thought with, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which things I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. The Apostle Paul persecuted the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the first century and he believed that he was doing God's service by doing just that. And there are those who believe the same today. The anti-Semitism of God's people, the Jews. Those who would wish the extermination of the Jews believe that they are doing God's service. Or at least they're God's service. When Muslims persecute and kill Christians in other nations around the world, they believe that they are doing the service of their God. By destroying the scourge of Christianity. This is what the Apostle Paul, when he was known as Saul of Tarsus, believed. Paul mentions these facts in his letters as well, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9. He mentions it again in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 6 and 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13. And as he states these facts there in other letters, he's, he marvels that God could save such a sinner, such a man, as the Apostle Paul.
The Apostle Paul, when he was known as Saul of Tarsus, he actually thought that Jesus was an imposter. His message of salvation, a lie. As the Pharisees did. As the Sadducees did. In the days of Christ. He was sure that God had spoken through Moses, but how could he be sure that God had spoken through Jesus of Nazareth? Steeped in Jewish tradition, young Saul of Tarsus championed his faith. His reputation as a zealous persecutor of the sect of the Nazarenes became known to people far and wide. In fact, if we go back to Acts chapter 9, in verses 13 and 14, after Paul after Saul had seen Christ on the Damascus road and was brought into the city of Damascus, blinded by that light that he had seen. God instructs a believer there named Ananias. He calls Ananias to go in verse 11 to a street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas of one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And he hath seen a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he may receive his sight. Ananias' response there in verse number 13 is this. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Everybody knew that this brilliant student of Rabbi Gamaliel was well on his way to becoming an influential leader in the Jewish faith. He was on the fast track of becoming very influential. The other rabbis of the Jewish faith. Paul's personal religious life and his scholarship, the knowing of the Word of God and the Scriptures, his zeal in opposing. Alien religious faiths all combined to make him the most respected young rabbi of his day. But then something happened. Something miraculous happened to Saul of Tarsus. And we all know and understand the story. There in Acts chapter 9. Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church, became Paul the apostle and preacher of the gospel. And this wasn't a gradual process that Paul went through. It happened in a moment. It happened in the blink of an eye. And the change was radical. It happened to him suddenly and without warning in Acts chapter 9 and there in verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, the way of Christianity, the way of Christ, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as they journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished 
said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said, and the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. He was there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Saul was on the way to Damascus to per persecute the believers. And a few days later he was in Damascus preaching to the Jews that the Christians were right. How could the Judaizers explain this sudden transformation? Was Saul's remarkable about face caused by his own people, the Jews? It's unthinkable. The Jews were encouraging and supporting Saul in his program of persecution of the church. They were encouraging him, keep going. Let's go. Let's get rid of these Christians. Let's stamp out this Christianity once and for all. The Jews' response. And his conversion would be a great embarrassment to the Jews. Remember, Saul of Tarsus, he was on the fast track. He was going to be the next great Jewish Rabbi. And now he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and he's a Christian? How embarrassing is that? Was, Saul cha was Saul's change caused by the Christians? That he was persecuting? Certainly the believers prayed for him. And no doubt the, the death of Stephen back in Acts chapter 7, especially the glorious testimony that Stephen had given there, affected Saul of Tarsus very deeply. He mentions, he mentions in Acts chapter 22 again in verses 19 and 20. In Acts chapter 22 and verses 19 and 20. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I, was, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. On that day, the young Saul of Tarsus, that rabbi that was rising in the ranks, heard that testimony of Stephen. He was there when they stoned him. I believe that, and the Bible doesn't say specifically, but I believe God used the testimony of Stephen to convict the heart of Saul of Tarsus. And that came to culmination in Acts chapter 9. The pricks that the Lord talked about that Saul was kicking against was those pricks of conviction in Saul of Tarsus' heart that God was convicting him with. That he was tossing aside as fast as he could. Stephen's testimony had affected, had affected Paul deeply, but Christians ran from the Apostle Paul. Even in Acts chapter 9 and verses 10 through 16, they were skeptical. 
that this Saul of Tarsus was even truly saved. No, he's not saved. He's just faking it so that he can get more Christians to persecute and throw more Christians in jail and have more Christians killed. And the Christians said, as far as we know, they had no idea that this young rabbi would ever become a Christian. Did the Jews cause Paul's conversion? No. Did the Christians cause Paul's conversion? No. So if the amazing change in Paul wasn't caused by the Jews of the church, then who caused it? There's only one source that could have caused it. That's the grace of the Almighty God. It was God's doing. It was God's working. And just as he worked in Saul of Tarsus' salvation, God's grace works in our hearts to bring salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone and what a great and wonderful thing that is and we will leave things there for now we'll leave you hopefully wanting more 